Delegate Paul Espinosa is with us via telephone. He's running for Senate himself. Paul, good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Mac. Good morning, John. Good morning. morning. Good to be with you this morning. Yeah, I brought you on for the Route 340 update uh, as a Jefferson County uh, elected official here. Uh, but uh, just uh, thought, I don't know if you heard the Ryan Weld interview yesterday at all. Or, uh, I did. Yeah, what, what were your thoughts on his reasons for not running for office, ultimately? Well, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I tend to agree with, uh, with uh, most of what's, what's already been said here this morning. Um, uh, you know, I, I have not had a chance to really talk with Ryan, uh, Senator Weld, uh, you know, at, at any length. Uh, I did reach out to him uh, after his announcement to uh, just... Uh, you know, express uh, express my support for you know what had to be a difficult decision for him, and to uh, also express uh, my hope that we'll we'll have an opportunity to be able to serve together in the Senate. But uh, you know, I think one thing I, I guess I guess a couple points, Rob. Uh, first, you know, I think sometimes you know we lose a little uh, we, we lose sight of the fact that you know of what pre candidacy is about. I mean, a pre candidacy is really an opportunity, a, a time period to really try to ascertain, you know, whether you do, uh, you know, have a viable, you know, path forward, you know, in your campaign. It's an opportunity, obviously, to begin to secure the financial resources that you need in order to be able to uh, run a, a viable campaign. And, you know, it's it's not it's not terribly unusual uh, for, you know, folks who, who do cl- declare pre-candidacy to decide for a variety of reasons that it's maybe just not you know, it's not going to pan out the way that that they had hoped. You, you look at myself, for example, back in 2016, I had filed pre-candidacy for the state senate. I uh, had uh, full intent to uh, to move forward uh, with my senate candidacy, but uh, our House Education Chair at the time, uh, Delegate Amanda Pasden, informed the Speaker, uh, then Speaker Tim Armstead, that she was going to be resigning her seat. Uh, either right at the end of uh, of 15 or right there at the beginning of 16. And uh, 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 Speaker Armstead uh, approached me and, and asked if I would consider possibly remaining in the House and serving as House Education Chair. You know, he, he thought that I could do a really good job in that role, but he really wasn't interested in, you know, having multiple uh, education chairs in a series of, of a, just a couple of years. So, uh, you know, if if if, uh, if I wanted to serve in that role, he, he'd want me to remain in the House for some period of time so that uh, could have some continuity there. And so, you know, in that case, uh, you know, again, while I certainly had full intent of running for the Senate, I came to the determination that it was really you know, in the best interest of the Eastern Panhandle to have someone in that key spot, and so uh, made that decision. And you've seen others, uh, J.B. McCuskey, who, you know, was uh, you know, staging or hoping to stage a gubernatorial campaign. I think he came to the conclusion fairly early on, uh, perhaps uh, after Moore Capito ended up, ended, in the, ended up in the race or announced his uh, intention to run for governor, that it just wasn't going to be in the cards for him to uh, run a successful campaign. And then he, he entered the, the attorney general's race, which, you know, I'm sure really changed the dynamics of the attorney general's race. So, so I respect, you know, uh, Ryan's decision. You know, perhaps I'll have an opportunity to talk with him uh, more. I, 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 I certainly appreciate that, you know, uh, trying to wage a successful statewide campaign is – you know, a, a bit different than either a delegate or a state senate campaign. I mean, in, in our campaigns, I mean, you know, we're much closer to our constituents. Whereas, in a, a statewide campaign, there are you know stakeholders that you know, are weighing in and that you're hoping to uh, attract their financial support. So, uh, a whole different dynamic. And, and having not run a statewide campaign, I can't really speak about it. You know, with any uh, with any uh, great uh, you know, wisdom there, but uh, I certainly appreciate that there are different dynamics in a statewide campaign. What are your thoughts on campaign donations with the idea that I'm donating to you, I would like you to vote my way? I've talked to candidates about this issue before, and most say I've never accepted or changed a vote based on a campaign donation that I didn't already have uh, my belief in. In other words, if if you're a, a big 2A guy, you'll accept donations from the NRA, for instance. If you're not a big 2A guy, you probably won't. But then again, they probably wouldn't donate to you. 
So your thoughts on that, Paul? Have you ever thought about changing a vote because of a campaign contribution? Absolutely not. Uh, And, you know, frankly, I've taken campaign contributions from folks who I suspect they probably realized that I probably wasn't going to be in their camp (laughs) on on legislation. But I think there is a recognition, even from uh, from entities that, you know, may not. you know, may you know may not agree with my stance on something that you know they 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 know that uh, there uh, are expenses associated with, with running a campaign. I mean, uh, uh, of course, uh, at the top of the list has to be radio advertising, right? Uh, you have to have, have to get your message oh, out yeah. on the radio, and uh, <laughs> but all the other types of uh, you know methods that you use in order to uh, you know try to get your message out. And I think there is an appreciation that there is a cost to that. I, I get the sense, uh, you know, at least in my experience, that you know, folks uh, just would like to be heard. You know, which is something that you know I would I typically try to do, uh, whether or not somebody is supporting my campaign or not. I'm happy to sit down with virtually anyone and hear their perspective, and I think that's part of the. Uh, I think part if, if there is an ask on a uh, you know with a campaign contribution, it's just a willingness to listen to what they have to say. Does it mean that you're ultimately going to uh, side with them? And again, as I've mentioned, there are a number of situations where I've accepted campaign contributions. And when it came down to it, you know, after politely listening to, you know, what their uh, thoughts are on potential legislation, you know, we just just didn't agree. But I've never really felt a a quid pro quo, if you will, uh, uh, you know, with any of that. It's just a recognition that uh, there is there are expenses associated with campaigns. Folks are happy to be helpful or generally happy to be helpful. I've been very gratified with the level of support I've had uh, during my uh, Senate uh, pre-candidacy. And, uh, but I think, more, I think first and foremost, I think folks just want to, you know, uh, be convinced that you have an open ear. doesn't mean that you'll ultimately side with them, but you're at least willing to hear them out. And, again, that's something I do uh, with or without a campaign contribution. John? I've, on the flip side of that, does it ever happen, you know, I've, I used to work for a lobbyist um, ages ago, uh, and you back the candidate that supports the industry, in this case it was the recycling industry, you back the candidates that most strongly support the the priorities of your industry. So, and and I know that there were times that we would back candidates who did not come through when the final vote came, they went the other way, and of course, they lost the backing of the uh, trade association where where I worked. It wasn't necessarily a quid pro quo, but it was definitely a statement of of priorities. So it just seems like there's there's a fine line there. So does it often happen, if not to you, then through you know among your colleagues? I presume you talk about these things that. There is a pressure if you've gotten a, a, a bunch of money, and I don't know what that definition is in in state politics. But if somebody's donated a hundred thousand dollars to a campaign, there is pressure to to support the priorities of that donor. Otherwise, that money just goes away. It's not necessarily it's not extortion, but it's certainly a statement of priorities. Isn't it? Doesn't it kind of cross a, a not an illegal line, but an uncomfortable line? Well, to be clear, in West Virginia, we do have campaign finance limits, and it's essentially $2,800 per election cycle. So for the primary, for example, a uh, individual, uh, a corporation cannot make a contribution. Uh, through their PAC, they can make a contribution if they do have a PAC, and uh, other rules apply there, but there's still a $2,800 per election cycle limit. So, you know. I mean, $2,800 may sound like a lot of money to some folks, but, I mean, in the scope of things, I mean, it's just, you know, I've never felt pressure, you know, to vote a certain way based on a $2,800 contribution. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. probably this election cycle I'll probably end up, uh, you know, hoping to raise probably over $100,000 in order to make sure that I have a, you know, a uh, uh, sufficient resources in order to uh, to run my campaign. But, in the scope of thing, one little one. It's a relatively small contribution, and again, I've I've just never really felt that pressure. And I think folks know me well enough to know that it just it's it's not going to uh, it, it's it, it's not going to sway me one way or the other. Uh, you know, even 
even in cases where perhaps someone has not uh, maybe supported my campaign, has supported my opponent, I'm still willing to sit down with them. And if it's good policy, it's good policy. And so I think that's something that I, that I hope folks respect uh, about me. And uh, I've, I guess I've been in a pretty fortunate situation, John, in that, you know, I, I've, I've garnered, you know, uh, a host of endorsements. I mean, the, the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce, uh, the West Virginia Manufacturers Association, uh, just to, to name a few, the, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've had strong ratings, uh, A ratings from the uh, NRA, uh, just a, a host of uh, endorsements. And so, I, but I think first and foremost, I think folks know that I approach my role seriously and that I'm going to be willing to uh, listen even to folks that I'm probably not inclined to support their legislation. I'm happy to sit down and see if we can find common ground. And, and I think that's uh, what's enabled me, at least, to uh, be able to attract uh, support uh, needed in order to wage a successful campaign. And let me make it clear, in case it was fuzzy at all, I'm in no way implying that that you have crossed any lines or or. Have been, no, I uh, didn't take it that way, John. Okay, good. I did. I was uh, <laughs> uh, Matt Miller. I, I would ask again, not having ever run for an office and not fully understanding those things, how much of that money, as as you're seeking as a candidate, is it you approaching a particular group or organization, or how much is it that group or organization looking at you and how you're running your uh, your race and, and the things you're standing for kind of approaching you because they're in agreement with you. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's probably a, a combination of, of both, uh, Matt. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, part of uh, waging a, uh, a particularly a Senate campaign, uh, but, you know, even some of some House campaigns, I mean, you typically do try to host a few fundraisers, a few organized events where folks, uh, you know, know that that's, that's what it's about. It's about, uh, you know, uh, coming out and expressing your financial support. But uh, I, you know, I, I uh, have typically, uh, you know, received, uh, you know, substantial number of contributions from just a lot of the kind of uh, pro-economic development type of uh, organizations against the West, West Virginia Chamber of Commerce, uh, certainly the uh, – Eastern Panhandle Business Association, uh, they, they've been very supportive of my campaign. I mentioned the West Virginia Manufacturers Association, which, of course, is, you know, uh, certainly very, very pro-economic uh, development in, in West Virginia, you know, just to name a few. There are a few uh, uh, entities out there that have a policy that uh, they do require you to request a contribution. They don't want to you know, send a contribution to somebody that doesn't want it, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, there are a, there are a few that do actually, you know, uh, require a request, and, and typically that's simply just a, an email or, or, a, or a letter, a brief letter, just saying, you know, we would appreciate your support of my campaign. But it's, it's a variety of reasons. And, again, I think there's a recognition out there, and even from not just from businesses, but I think from you know I've I've, uh, I've garnered a lot of support from uh, just individual uh, and uh, you know couples uh, here in the uh, in the 16th district that just realize that hey you know I'm sure you know they from their perspective they they recognize that it has to be expensive in order to. Uh, to wage a campaign. I mean, they see the advertisements, uh, you know, on uh, on Channel 10 and uh, and in the newspaper. They see the direct mail. They know there's a cost associated with that, and and they're willing to pitch in a little bit. And again, uh, any any uh, contribution is appreciated. And uh, you know, again, there doesn't there's there's never a discussion or an ex- expectation that. That's going to mean I'm going to vote a certain way. They recognize there's an expense associated with running a campaign, and and they just want to be supportive. So uh, that's kind of uh, how that uh, typically pans out. Paul, let's talk about Route 340 before we run out of time here. If you could give us a progress or status update on the construction going on with uh, Rock Barrier Wall through Harpers Ferry. Yeah, the good news is I, I did speak with um, – uh, Department of Highways officials yesterday, and uh, light is at the end of the tunnel. Uh, they are on track to complete the project on or before December 10th. I, I've actually seen some speculation, you know, from uh, you know from some sources, uh, not official sources, that you know it could happen, uh, you know, even as soon as, as this week. Uh, essentially, all of the slope work 
uh, on the uh, the project. Uh, all that removal of the loose rock, all that's been complete. All the installation of the various barriers, uh, the rock barriers, as well as the uh, chain leak uh, drape, if you will, that uh, is designed to help uh, you know ensure that any rocks that do fall, you know, don't enter the roadway. All that is complete. So it's a, the slope work is com- is 100% complete, along with all the barriers. At this point, it's just a matter of really uh, just completing work on the roadway. Uh, the initial plans, as I understand it, were to probably delay the uh, the uh, asphalt uh, paving until uh, until warmer weather. But because they were actually running ahead of schedule, they were able to complete that uh, that slope work and, and the uh, the draping and uh, barrier work uh, faster than than anticipated. They've actually completed all of the paving. So at this point, it's just a matter of just just completing the the uh, the final. Uh, touches on that paving, uh, installing the rumble strip, which is typically down the middle of the highway that we've uh, become accustomed to, the uh, the uh, reflective uh, pavement markers that go down the center, and then I think probably one of the final uh, parts of that will be the, the painting. And uh, uh, I'm told that it's a lot of it's just weather dependent uh, as far as just, as, you know, if they, if, as long as they have good weather, you know, they'll be able to hopefully get that finished uh, sooner than December 10th. But, uh, again, light at the end of the tunnel. I know it's been a painful uh, several weeks, uh, actually a couple months, uh, for uh, for folks that, that use that route. Uh, I've, I've had to use that route a few times myself, and it, it, it wasn't as pleasant, although I think they made the best out of a, out of a very difficult situation. But uh, we're within uh, just uh, hopefully a few days here of having that project complete. Would this be the first road project completed on time in the history of uh, road construction, Paul? <laughs> Well, I, I know myself and a number of my legislative colleagues, we met with the Department of Highways officials probably, what, over a year and a half ago, you know, when uh, the discussion first started uh, coming about. And we wanted assurances that, uh, you know, they were looking at the project very seriously and wanted to they stay to the timeline and also wanted to ascertain that there wasn't any other time of the year that could be a better time of the year than to do it. And, uh we came away from, I know, uh, at least I came away from those meetings just uh, appreciating that there's really no good time for this, uh, that this is probably the best time. They wanted to stay out of extremely cold weather, you know, while we're starting to get into some cold weather now. Again, uh, the, all the, the slope work is now complete, so that's really not an issue. So I think the timing probably worked out about as well as it could. And, uh, uh, again, fortunately, I think the weather really cooperated, and uh, they were able to get this done. I think one of the things, too, that uh, that uh, was shared with me is that Department of Highways officials were were very fortunate in order in in securing the services of a gentleman who had uh, uh, extensive experience with these type of projects. I believe the gentleman was based out of North Carolina, and so they brought him on, I believe, as a consultant to basically uh, be on site and be able to make, you know, instantaneous decisions so that rather than, you know, have an issue arise and then having to go back to Charleston and say, you know, uh, you know what do you all think about this, they basically empowered him based on his experience with these type of projects to make, uh, make immediate decisions, you know, on site. And that really kept the project uh, not only on track but actually ahead of schedule. So uh, we were very fortunate, apparently, in securing someone who had that type of expertise. I look forward to getting through Shepherdstown a little easier once this is done. John, I know you've noticed a difference there, too. Oh, uh, traffic has been a mess, and it goes all the way down Route 9 to try to get into uh, Northern Virginia. Do we have an idea of what the economic impact of this has been on the the businesses that are most easily accessed through 340 through there? Yeah, very difficult to say, uh, John. I, I know that uh, the estimates I saw just as far as the amount of traffic that goes through that way was uh, over 20,000 vehicles a day. And so you could just imagine, you know, that the, the economic impact, not only commuters, but folks, you know, visiting the area. And I think one of the goals, too, now that uh, we are here just, uh, just days away from completion is to try to get this thing wrapped up, uh, obviously, you know, old time Christmas in in Harpers Ferry. That's a big uh, big event. So uh, I think officials and uh, all those uh, uh, directly impacted by those type of events uh, uh, would 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 uh, love to 
see that uh, completed, uh, you know, sooner rather than later, so that it doesn't have any further impact. But I, I do commend the um, the Retail uh, Merchants Association down at Harpers Ferry and others who participated in the town halls that Department of Highways hosted, and I think the consensus was uh, that they wanted Department of Highways to get in get it done and get out rather than to stretch this thing out. I know there were suggestions of maybe trying to keep one lane open during the project, and uh, you know, that, that was really not feasible for another for, for a variety of reasons, uh, safety probably uh, chief among those. But uh, I think there was a recognition that there probably was no good time to do it, but that it had to be done. And, again, I think as folks saw some of the pictures of some of those rock uh, uh, cliffs, the, the overhang there, and uh, what came down as they were, you know, uh, uh, trying to uh, re- remove any loose rock and everything, uh, I think there was a recognition that it had to be done, and I uh, certainly commend uh, those folks for, you know, understanding that uh, there was no good time to do it, and uh, as long as Department of Highways would get in and get it done efficiently, that uh, that uh, they could they could bear with it for a few months uh, in order to, you know, achieve a much safer roadway going through there. I'm assuming uh, that this project finishing on time means they didn't run into any major things that that maybe they did not anticipate. In other words, it it kind of went smoothly the way they expected. Yeah, I, I asked uh, Department of Highways officials, you know, what were any any major lessons learned, and I, I think they were just uh, very uh, they they felt very fortunate that they were again were able to secure the services of this this uh, contractor that uh, had you know, uh, extensive experience with this. And I think empowering that individual to make on-site decisions as opposed to having those uh, have to be rerouted down to engineering in Charleston for decisions, I I think that's something uh, probably that they will use in the future, you know, in in certain situations where it really makes sense, where time is of the essence, to uh, just make sure that you have someone on site that can make those type of you know split second decisions and, and keep a project on site on on track so uh, i think that really worked out and uh, i don't know if there's other projects in west virginia that uh, will like this but uh, i gotta think that there probably are and uh, i'm sure they'll have this guy's uh, name at the top of the rolodex so to speak uh, so that uh, yeah, again they can uh, hopefully have as successful an experience as they as they had here on this project, uh, albeit, albeit with, uh, you know, uh, traffic issues that I think everybody realized were going to uh, result. Uh, I think they made the best of, out of a, a difficult situation. A decentralizing government for highway departments maybe also works other places too, Paul. You never know. <laughs> well, I've always been a, uh, an advocate for trying to make decisions closer to uh, my constituents, so uh, uh, it looks like it's certainly borne out in this case. Indeed. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate your time this morning.